Today I have a currently reading update for you. Um, it's currently the end of June or very close to the end of June and I have been reading a lot of things all at the same time which is something I I don't honestly know if this is a habit I have as a reader that I you know just pick up new books even though I'm still not done with previous ones but this month in particular has been very eclectic. I think I've just been so excited to finally have time to read again that I just, I couldn't keep my hands off of all of these books basically. So we'll start with the book that I started first. I've probably only finished one of these books, maybe two of these books, um, but they're all super interesting. They're all about very diverse topics and I just thought maybe you'd find something in here that you are interested in as well. So The Despot's Accomplice by Brian Class, How the West is Aiding and Abetting the de Decline of Democracy. Uh, and by the decline of democracy, they do mean, or uh, he does mean uh, global democracy and how the world is on a sort of downward trend, becoming more authoritarian and less democratic, and how particularly the foreign policy of uh, England and the United States uh, has uh, really impacted the rest of the world. And uh, I think this is a really interesting book. It's kind of a disturbing book to read because uh, you just, there's so much evidence uh, that he draws on and uh, so much evidence for the, the this decline of democracy. And um, actually in the introduction, he writes that he thought his thesis was too pessimistic. And then after the events of Donald Trump's election and um, Brexit and all of these, uh, really major uh, developments, he actually thinks that his thesis was too optimistic. So I think this is a really important one. If you're particularly interested in Donald Trump and that kind of stuff, then maybe you'd like to read the sequel, which is The Despot's um, Apprentice. Uh, and yeah, I just, I think this is a really important read. I can't wait to finish it. It's so, um, it's heavy, but it's but it's really illuminating. It tells you a lot about the history of democracy. Um, doesn't isn't just limited to uh, the West. He really does uh, go into the politics of lots of different nations and how the West's relationship with these nations um, has really impacted their political systems. So I I think this is a very worthy read, and I can't wait to finish this one. Uh, the next one that I picked up and I'm trying to do this somewhat in chronological order, but I don't quite remember, um, is an essay by Albert Camus, which is Create Dangerously. I've read The Myth of Sisyphus by Albert Camus, uh, and I've read um, The Stranger by Albert Camus. And so this was the first one I'd read about uh, kind of creativity and artisthood and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and it's obviously Penguin Modern, uh, read a new series. Each one is one pound, so uh, I picked up like four or five of these and it was awesome. Uh, and I really, really love this one. If you've ever read Camus, you'll know that his writing style is just addictive and you really just want to get into it and um, you get really immersed in his writing and his metaphors and his just choices for words and for um, the way that he links his ideas together. I think this is evident in uh, Create Dangerously as, as much as any of his other uh, writing. I found it particularly interesting because I'm uh, very much in a stage where I uh, have recently, you know, started sharing my art and uh, in the last year. And he talks about how the artist at first has this purpose and has this like, um, has no limitations almost. And then they start to realize that, oh, they're in this amphitheater and there are, um, you know, external influences that are almost pressuring them to keep up the same standard that they never even had for themselves. They only ever wanted to share that work. Uh, and now the work has become almost mandatory and how like creating publicly is creating dangerously and creating in this day and age and on all of this stuff. And I think it's so applicable, even though it was written in the uh, 20th century, I think it's so applicable to the 21st century with social media and with all this stuff uh, and conversations around the artists. So 
I would highly recommend this one. There's also an essay in here called The Defense of Intelligence. There's also another one called Bread and Freedom. Uh, I personally only read Create Dangerously, so moving on. Um, the next one is the one of the few ones I finished in this uh, currently reading pile, which is The Tao of Nature by Chuang Tzu. I intended to do like a full-on review video of this and I might still do that, uh, but I mean this is just a really loaded piece of writing. It was written in the 4th century BC, a very 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 long time ago, and it was written in China, it uh, discusses this concept of the Tao, uh, it discusses um, human nature, it discusses the difference between human, the human and the divine. Uh, it's really interesting. Uh, one of the best quotes in it is actually on the cover, which is, but I could not tell. Had I been trying to dreaming I was a butterfly or a butterfly dreaming I was trying to. So um, as you can tell, it's going to deal a lot with appearance and reality. And actually, I find the ancient Chinese uh, version of these kinds of philosophical debates are um, almost dialectic, but I... I don't like using that word because I do think it's kind of like a ripoff of the original which is just yin and yang everything is part of the same whole and opposition is just the way that we perceive it but there isn't no opposition in fact and it talks a lot about the perfect human um, if there were a human that could that could embody the Tao which is this un uh, unspecified like unspecifiable even concept um, it's just, it's really illuminating. I think it's filled with contradictions, but I think that's also the point. There is even no truth, no reality to look to. There's no knowledge we can gain. It's just all like part of the same whole. And I just found it really enlightening. I really want to reread it. Um, I was like in there with a pencil, like circling things, trying to uh, gain as much as I could out of this because it's such an ancient text and it's, it's so, fascinating this is the origin of philosophy like these are the first thinkers i always find like ancient philosophy so interesting because we seem to have like the same patterns of thought even though we're in completely different circumstances in a way but in another way you could say that our existence has always you know is, is has always had these um categories that define it uh so it's all the kantian idea that you know we bring something to existence existence doesn't change and like change with time i guess uh it it we have a structure that we impose on existence and so if that's the case that explains how like such ancient thoughts can still stand true and and ring true to modern day and i like the more ancient it is, the more interesting it is for me. So uh, highly, highly recommend this one. Uh, these are actually extracts uh, from a book that collects uh, Trang Tzu's entire writing. So if you are interested uh, or if you've already read this and you'd like to read more, there's the book of Trang Tzu, the Penguin Classics edition, if you'd like to read more of Trang Tzu. Um, I've also been reading uh, the Tao Te Ching uh, but I'm always kind of reading that one, so I don't really feel like putting it in this currently reading pile, but ancient Chinese philosophy is pretty dope. Uh, next up, we have a really interesting one, one that I really would like, I would love to finish soon because uh, I think this is great reading for my dissertation, um, which is Nausea by Jean-Paul Sartre. Uh, this is a diary. Um, it's like a novel in diary format, but Nausea is actually really interesting. So... Um, the main character you follow is very is a very existential agent. He, I think, probably um, he just views the world in a very uh, particular way, in a very flawed way. He 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 likes uh, categorizing things and understanding things in their like true nature or whatever. And I think he comes to the realization that things don't actually have inherent meaning. Things don't. Um, things don't have a truth to them that you bring the truth to them and that you bring the meaning to them and so i think that it's just like an existential struggle of this um guy in france 
in the 20th century and uh, it's really interesting so far I think the writing is fantastic and it tells you so much about the like the philosophy that's trying to kind of imbue itself into it and obviously Sartre is a philosopher and so um, I think his philosophy and his literature really go hand in hand and I, I think it's a really interesting discussion and why I'm reading this for my dissertation is the interesting discussion that goes along with trying to um, look at literature from a philosophical standpoint and trying to look at philosophy as including literature as well so um, I'm really really enjoying this one I've underlined so many I'm reading it like an A-level text basically so um, it's super interesting he's a historian the main character and like there's a lot of other details I'm sure that um, will un reveal themselves in the plot I'm really early on in this book still but um, I don't think that really matters. I think most of all I'm like looking for the philosophy in it. So uh, maybe that'll reveal itself in the plot. But I think most of all it's like the character's um, phenomenological experience that I'm looking at. Uh, and that's really intriguing at the moment. Next we have a uh, kind of language book. I'm reading uh, Arabic Verbs and Essentials of Grammar, A Practical Guide to the Mastery of Arabic by Jane Whitewick and Mahmoud Ghaffar. Or Ghaffar? I'm not sure how to pronounce his name because it's not written in Arabic. But um, So yes, I am bilingual. If you don't know already, I speak uh, Arabic was my mother tongue. and um, But yeah, I think my Arabic could be improved a lot. So I'm reading this because I think verbs and... Uh, um, the way that they change based on like their implications and uh, their position in a sentence is really like essential for uh, mastering Arabic and I personally don't feel like I've mastered Arabic by any means so I'm kind of making my way through this book and learning things and um, trying to have a more explicit grasp of my language I would highly recommend this one this is really useful because it explains things in English but using uh, the way that natives would explain them in Arabic because when I was in school they used to explain things in a certain way and then whenever I tried to read like linguistics of Arabic books and things like that it was just completely different and I had no like foundation for what they were talking about but this really does use the like native foundations uh, that they would teach you in school but builds on those and tries to explain them in a more easy to grasp way I guess um, it starts with the root system uh, and then it explains how based on um, like whether the verb is regular or irregular it will like conjugate in certain ways and whether it's feminine or masculine or singular or double or plural and all this stuff so it's really useful uh, I haven't started taking any notes from this yet but uh, I do plan on doing that and uh, I think my Arabic will improve as a result so this alongside hopefully starting to read and more like Arabic novels and things like that will eventually improve my grammar, I hope. <laughs> okay. uh, the next one, I don't have the book that I actually read, this is a graphic novel, but uh, this is the second part that I'm super excited to read, so this is almost like a TBR placeholder for the book that I've already read, which is Persepolis by Marianne Satrapi. Uh, it took me like way too long to actually finally pick up these books because I've had them for so long. Uh, I haven't read this one, which is the story of a return, but I did read the first one, which is the story of a childhood, and it talks about the history of Iran and the warfare and sort of being perceived in a certain way to certain countries. Meanwhile, just trying to fight for your freedom. It's as simple as like people trying to fight for their freedom, people who lived in a society that was very open and progressive in a lot of ways but just because they had oil just because they uh were conflicting with western interests the west just kind of jumped in there um caused some trouble uh kind of played it off as uh terrorism and then like the war has basically never ended you know just introducing very um limited and and oppressive uh islamic law to a country that really wasn't a part of that at all and how quickly things can change like the story of a childhood persepolis one which is a red book not blue but um 
th that one is just so illuminating, especially from a child's perspective. I love graphic novels that are written from a child's perspective because I think it's such a uh, easy way to uh, convey like really like heartbreaking things uh, very simply and very like explicitly. Um, because be because maybe the child doesn't understand, but you as a, like an adult reader will be able to connect the dots in a way that the children might not be able to. Um, yeah, I just I found it really interesting to learn about the history of Iran more, and actually uh, the despot's accomplice touched a little bit on Iran, which is uh, I had like very little background, read a bit of this, read a bit of this, and uh, I feel a lot more um, educated now, and I I need to read this one to feel even more educated and to um, learn about the history of these countries that we really like have such a prejudice against but in truth it's it's much more complicated than it is black and white and terrorism you know having a progressive uh, country and having a not so prog progressive country like Egypt my own country is very um, conservative at the moment but it didn't always used to be and there is a history and there is a, a global influence that leads to these things and leads to the prejudices we hold i think it's just really important and uh it was such a good read like i can't explain enough how good of a read it was this is kind of an art style um so well written so well written so well thought out so well executed i just i loved it next up we've got uh wisdom and metaphor by Jan's wiki, a uh, very uh, strangely named woman, but amazing, intelligent woman. Um, she is uh, a Canadian academic. Uh, this is my uni's library book. I actually requested my library pick this one up because Jan's wiki uh, talks a lot about this kind of stuff that I want to talk about in my dissertation, which is how poetry and metaphor and allegory and analogy and basically all non-traditional forms of conveying a truth or an idea uh, is actually more effective than all these other ways of um, communicating ideas explicitly like in the scientific method um, so uh, she talks a lot about philosophy but also about mathematics and gestalt theory which is the idea that the whole is more than the sum of its parts and uh, she talks a lot about, um, like she draws on lots of other philosophers, Wittgenstein, uh, Wertheimer, um, many, many other people who I've never heard of. And so it's really useful for my uh, research. But uh, what I love about her books, and this is the second book that she's written, she's written Lyric Philosophy. Her, the form that she writes her books in kind of reflect her points, which is that form is very important and that you can't just have like an explicit um, writing style that, that is purely like a narration or, or um, follows the tradition of a treatise uh, in order to convey these like complex ideas. So basically the way it's written is that she has a point to make and then she has like other people so on the right side of the book she has her own points that she's making and then on the left side of the book she has um other people's uh, ideas that sort of reflect the ideas that she's trying to communicate uh, and so it uh can be really really interesting as a read uh i think and um yeah, I, I'm really enjoying this one. I'm speeding through it because of the way that it's written and uh, really collecting like the gems that I need for my dissertation. And uh, Jan Zwicky, actually, if you're interested in uh, those kinds of ideas, has a uh, lecture on YouTube that only has about 12 views, but it's honestly one of the best lectures I've ever heard on the topic that I'm really interested in. Uh, and she talks a lot about mathematics and poetry and gestalt and um, philosophy. So if you're interested in that, I will link her lecture down below and go check it out for sure. Next up, this uh, is also a library book I got, uh, The Language of Inquiry by Lynn Hedgenian? Hedgenian? I'm not, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name. Um, also talking about very similar topics. A recommendation I actually got from Matt uh, on his Instagram. Uh, Matt from Polyglot Progress has an awesome Instagram that he, where he shares his book finds and honestly he finds such incredible books that I'm so interested in so this was one of them that I was like 
I must find this book and thankfully my library had it but um, this is such a well-written book so it's a collection of essays I've currently only read the introduction and like the beginning of the first essay but I'm thinking I'm actually going to skip a few essays and just try to find the essays that really resonate with the topic that I want to discuss um, Lynn talks a lot about how uh, poetry is um, like an essential form for inquiry. Poetry is actually the language of inquiry uh, because it uh, acknowledges how we think and a kind of the patterns of the way we think and the, the, the multitude of logics that we use in language, the multitudes of logics that we use in understanding. Like we don't just have one logic. But uh, a lot of the time, at least this is what I'm taking from the book, uh, a lot of the time philosophy assumes that there is just one correct logic and so it doesn't acknowledge all of these other ways that we understand things, all of these other ways that we draw patterns uh, between things, that we link things together. And so uh, I think she has a really like enlightened perspective about um, form and about thought uh, and I just can't wait to read her essays about all of these things. The introduction is gold and you can read it on Amazon. If you click on her book and look inside, you can read the introduction, it's fantastic. Let you know when I do read more of the essays in this book and kind of what I learned from them because they're really, like they just seem really, really well written um, and just really enlightening. So yes, I'm so glad I found this book. Thank you, Matt. Um, We've got Africa's Tardish Name by Chinua Achebe. Chinua Achebe is a very uh, famous African writer. Uh, he was actually most known for Things Fall Apart, which is a novel. Um, this is just a collection of his essays about Nigeria, about Africa, about um, literature surrounding Africa and why it's been really misrepresented and why, why <laughs> actually all of this literature that's so misrepresentative of Africa really, really impacted how people um, treated Africans and treated uh, the idea of Africa and how, especially like Joseph Conrad, who wrote uh, The Grapes of Wrath, was like just the biggest asshole in existence. Like he, <laughs> that's what I got out of it. I mean, he, he basically like, first of all, just because you're European doesn't mean when you do something it's the first time anybody ever did it, okay? And second of all, Africa was perfectly advanced beforehand, like before any European came along and actually learned from Africans and then claimed that Africans needed education and then like it started the Atlantic slave trade and then like I get really riled up about this because I'm African, obviously, but I'm North African and like as you can see I'm very light-skinned and uh, there's clearly some European in my blood because you know, my ancestors were raped by Europeans, probably, but it just infuriates me when people think that they are, like, the savior, the white savior, and, like, this is kind of the fury that Chinua Achebe is writing from. Um, he writes a lot about uh, how not all Europeans were white colonizers, you know, but at the same time, the influence of having one perspective of Africa be so like esteemed and and prized as yes this is the correct way to view Africa and used as a political tool as well to further the conquests that um, Europe had over Africa it's just it's messed up and it's like required reading um, in my opinion I, I can't really talk about this without getting emotional so I'm just gonna move on but definitely read this Finally, uh, I am also reading uh, Dante's Inferno, which is the first uh, book of the Divine Comedy, uh, which is the story of Dante and Virgil making their way through hell and the seven layers of hell and then going on to uh, purgatory and then paradise, I believe. And so it's kind of a tale that echoes the uh, Christian system. But what I love about this so far is uh, that it's very philosophical and deep. So Dante is trying to make a point, and I, I really haven't read enough to actually like 
have that many opinions about it so I'm very wary that I don't want to claim to know something that I don't but um, it confronts the crucial concepts of free will versus predestination, uh, predeterminism, um, confronts ideas of good and evil and uh, given that those, this was like the quintessential book of the middle ages and like I haven't really read any kind of middle ages texts I've only really read like super ancient stuff and then like super recent stuff so I'm trying to like fill in the, the gaps for myself and I think this is also going to be a really great read for my dissertation to like draw on how literature can really make a lot of philosophical points and really like further thought for a lot of people because I don't think in the middle ages they were reading philosophy but they were reading the poetry um and hearing the the the, the lyrics and the stories of uh, these poets and so I think um, this is going to be really essential I'm literally in the first few chapters of this one um, Dante had like met Virgil and they're about to go to hell so I wonder how things are going to play out I would love to have read like the whole divine comedy uh, at some point because I think um, just the idea that it's even called the Divine Comedy is like such a statement in itself, but I'm excited about the potential of this uh, read. So yes, those were my currently reading. Uh, this has been a very long video, and um, if I were to make like a to be read video, it would be even longer because I promise you like my desk is just like piled with books. As you can see behind me, I have like so many books that I really, really, really want to get on to. But I'm trying to take my time, trying not to pressure myself to read um, if I don't feel like it or read something just because I'm currently reading it and instead of picking up something that is more attuned to my interests that day, which is why I've just happened to have started reading so many different books in the past month. But uh, hopefully I will also finish some of these books and uh, begin writing my dissertation with some sort of background in a bunch of these topics. Uh, literature, philosophy, metaphor, uh, I've got some literary theory, I've got some language stuff, I've got some uh, purely pleasure reading, purely um, interest reading, but also some really essential texts that I really want to sink my teeth into soon. So let me know what you're reading down below, let me know which of these books you're most excited to hear more about, if you'd like to hear more about any of them. Um, and yeah, I hope to see you soon in another video. Bye!